morning, everybody. I would like to welcome very warmly Leanne Disler, who is a research fellow at the Center for Conflict Studies at the Phillips University in Marburg. Um, I'm Luca Berti, research fellow from the um, Economics Unit, and I will briefly introduce our speaker today before I hand over to him. Um, Vienna's current research, which is being funded by the German Research Foundation, focuses on state building and international administration. And what is looking at um, more in detail is the relation between the politics of state building, the politics of authority, and the politics of identity. So if I had to identify the core claim, the really the ground level foundational claim that stands at the very core of Werner Disler's work, I would say that it is that the politics of authority, authority and legitimacy, cannot be reduced to a legalistic institutionalist framework. If we have to explain dynamics of authority and legitimacy, we cannot, we cannot solely focus on the bureaucracy, on the legal environment, on the mandates and different functions of different institutions. We cannot just look at the institutional and legal framework. But we have to focus also on dynamics of identity. And his uh, theoretical framework in this context is applied to situations of post-conflict reconstruction and state building. So something very relevant for Kosovo for obvious reasons. And clearly, um, after a conflict, it's become kind of common after the Cold War, but also before, for international actors to come in, take over um, authority on an interim basis, and then focus on building local institutions to hand over authority and sovereignty to eventually, after the end of the interim period of transnational uh, administration. And clearly there's a whole set of challenges that face these actors in building the legitimacy and authority. Both of the newly founded institutions that are supposed to take over sovereignty um, upon completion of the period of international administration, but also in a uh, perhaps different fashion, the legitimacy and authority for the very interim uh, administration. And Venice's claim, as I said, is that um, what institutions have to do is to mobilize identity uh, and make sure that the, uh, that the citizens of the country identify very strongly with the institutions. And just to set, just to set the puzzle, one argument um, that's been widely made and has been made, I think, most famously by Mariana del Castillo in, fa in her famous and celebrated book on economic reconstruction in post-conflict settings, is that one of the reasons why the process of privatization in the early years of international administration in Kosovo stalled, the reason why it did not go through, was that the UN, UNMIC, did not have the legitimacy and authority to actually reallocate property rights, right? And that's the main reason why the process of privatization stalled, according to this, to this thesis. So, on the one hand, we have a set of theories that say, well, the, as, long as, the, as long as an authority has the legal power, is legally empowered to go on, push ahead with the process, the process should happen. But on the other hand, we've seen very well in Kosovo that even though AMIC was internationally entrusted with the power to um, reallocate property rights in Kosovo, under its mandate, under its international mandate, that did not happen in any smooth fashion. So we get a puzzle. How do we explain things like the slow process of privatization in Kosovo? Clearly we cannot do that by just mobilizing a legalistic framework. We have to look at other dimensions of authority and legitimacy to explain why things like the process of privatization in Kosovo was stalled. And I think this is where Werner Disler's work can, uh, can help us do. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Werner. We'll set some 30 to 40 minutes uh, for the lecture, and then we'll open up for the floor. Thank you. Uh, Luca, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to American University of Kosovo. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is actually my, uh, my last day in uh, Kosovo after roughly one year of uh, coming here, uh, spending some weeks and months in field research or research 
for our project at the University of Marburg in Germany. It is a three-year project and also now the last year of the project has started a couple of weeks ago, so we try to wrap up and uh, get into the phase of publishing. What I want to present today is work in progress. I know you hear this often, it's like an excuse. Uh, don't take it too serious. No, of course, it is a serious uh, um, matter and I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very much looking into maybe the discussion later. Um, uh, I gathered a lot of, uh, of data uh, regarding uh, the constitutional development of this um, country and uh, actually I just had an hour ago an interview with a person still involved with the, your constitutional development and um, so um, we are in the project also interested in the development, what is going on even until today so with the new constitution from 2008. Today, I want to focus, we jump back at the beginning of this process, uh, the constitutional debate and then the constitutional framework that was the predecessor uh, to your constitution of 2008. And in fact, it was a sui generis case uh, in international law. Never before did um, an international organization uh, draft a a, a document like this. So a very special document indeed. Before I start now, I want to sincerely thank um, the people who helped me uh, over time. A lot of them are here. Uh, I received a lot of support by the Friedrich Hebert Foundation. I was a guest there. So thank you very much for supporting the research and myself as a person. It was a good time. Nice colleagues. Wonderful. Okay. So let's see. Because it's, it's, uh, I, I, I wondered, I prepared it uh, yesterday, today also. There's so much going on in my head uh, I, because I'm so deep into the, the matter right now. I, I really try to focus and I have to leave a lot uh, to the side where we come there uh, in the discussion. I want to start with the dimensions of authority. Because in literature, authority is regularly mentioned in regard to state building processes, not even external state building processes. Authority is one of the key norms uh, in every political order, in every political system. So what kind of authority uh, uh, shall we talk about today? And then authority as a social product, I will get into that later. The second part, we go into the, uh, the empirical data and the case itself. The constitutional debate between 1999 after the uh, war uh, until 2001 and then the famous working group on this uh, constitutional framework, uh, which, as I mentioned before, is a, uh, a one-time uh, case uh, in the history of international law. And then the conclusions, I hope we can debate them. It's, it's, um, maybe we will have some, some nice discussions on that. So when you look into the literature of state building, Maybe you have some experience uh, on your own. You will get, as I mentioned before, a lot of uh, mentioning uh, the concept of authority. Um, it is regularly referred to in the so-called transfer of authority. So we have the idea, a rather technical idea, that somebody builds up authority together with institutions, state institutions. And then there is this moment where they give the authority to other persons, in this case, for example, actors in, uh, in Kosovo, political actors, political institutions, the hand of authority. We have a lot of uh, texts uh, dealing with the question of legitimacy and the perception of, of state-building enterprises uh, all over the world, and as well as in Kosovo. Um, but uh, if, you got, if, you, if you look into the uh, literature, you will realize very quickly that it is um, a not very well defined definition of authority is, as I said, it's rather technical. Uh, it's uh, like with all these uh, terms that are used, actually, state, nation, nation building, um, uh, constitution, talk about constitution, authority, these are in political thought and in political theory highly complicated and multifaceted. Um, uh, uh, concepts actually, 
But in the text, when you look at them, it seems like it's just something you can build up, handle, for example. So it's not clearly defined. Um, and um, uh, just to give you, because the last line, no simple application post-conflict state building processes. If you look at, at uh, political thought and theory, for example, there's always a connection between the authority and the population or the, the polis, the authority. You, but there's always a connection. You have the social contract, you have other forms of, but there's knowledge and there's a connection. And um, the, the, the situation of external state building, especially, uh, we realize we have, of course, we have a mandate, and we'll get into that later, but do we have any kind of connection or any kind of knowledge? I think we have to answer, especially in the early phases, no. As I said, it's not easy to get through all this, uh, this concept. I, 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 fo I focus on, on Friedman now. Friedman, uh, he has a very nice distinction. He's this, uh, there's a distinction between an actor is being in authority and an actor is being an authority. Totally different concepts. The in authority feels well known. It's like due to your position, due to the procedure you're in or the mandate, as I said before. We can use other words for it. You can use formal authority, de jure authority. It's authority you get by appointment, etc. And then you have another dimension of authority. They both can work on the same institution or actor. You, know, you have all these dimensions always, always together. The second dimension is authority that is not based on the position, but, but in what Friedman calls a special knowledge that convinces you to follow the authority. <coughs> There's no means of coercion. There's no threat. It's just like the way the, the authority talks, behaves, the language it uses, the symbolic references, the interpretation. Um, and now we're coming to what Luca also said, identity related. Um, and this is the dimension being an authority. We can call it a social product. And Friedman also gives this wonderful term, and I want to use it today, of authoritative communication, where I said before. Every authority needs to get in a relation with the subject of the authority. And you as the subject, you have to get in a relation, in a communication relation with the authority to ascribe the authority to me or to whatever authority it is. So uh, I want to specify our theoretical frame in the, uh, in the project. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's coming from system theory. It's called the theory of interpretive authority, just to make it a little bit more precise. So we have a, an actor or an institution which is referring to symbolic sources of identity. I could, for example, talk about our university for you, your students or other, uh, from other institutions. So we refer to a certain symbolic source of identity. And, and then this uh, actor wants to establish himself as the interpreter of the source of identity and the interpretation itself, these are different dimensions, um, um, to receive authority from the audience and uh, to um, uh, bring himself and, the, and his or, or her authority make a point of reference for the population. We assume, because the theoretical frame was developed in, um, and not for a uh, situation like, like a post-conflict situation with high level of external intervention. So when we look at post-war Kosovo, our assumption is that we have a multitude of actors. A multitude of actors claim authority. We have a break between systems and a new system is arising, whatever this will be. And now in this situation, I call it, I call it right now, for, for the struggle of authority begins. And not necessarily the struggle of authority being in authority, of course, but also the very important dimension of being in authority. Let's get to the, to, to the case. Um, the, concept, the, the context of the constitutional debate. We have a situation, 1244, the, famous, infamous resolution 1244, um, uh, takes precedence over other forms of law, other constitutions applied, 
uh, since summer uh, uh, um, uh, 1999. So we have a de facto interpreter. And his legal source, his source, the source for the authority is 1244. And if we look at Kosovo from the perspective of legal authority or formal authority, indeed it was the only legal authority. Where was it written? It was written in New York. It was a compromise between diplomats. We have, of course, on the ground and in literature, you know, you find terms like illegal or irregular. This, you can only apply this uh, kind of uh, authority, uh, these terms, when you do not think in the dimension of being an authority or interpretative uh, authority. We have competing interpreters and competing authority. For example, the Republic of Kosovo, um, uh, uh, Hugo and uh, the, the development from the beginning of the 90s uh, until 1999. We have the provisional government consisting of uh, uh, KLA um, um, uh, structures um, uh, led by uh, several people and Hassan uh, Fauci, of course. These institutions, in our frame, are, we just frame them as competing interpreters. <coughs> If you, look at the, if, if you look at the development of the institutional and legal development then from 1999 to 2000, as I said before, we have this one, we have 1244. We have Anmik coming in. We have um, Anmik has uh, not very much de facto control at that time on the ground because of very slow deployment, because of functioning structures of the other competing interpreters. There were structures of the Republic of Kosovo and the provisional government that worked on the ground in the on municipality levels in the cities. Um, so, Anmik started to try um, to establish uh, an institutional frame to bring in these competing interpreters. The Kosovo Transitional Council was founded very early then we have the agreement on the joint interim administration structures, end of 1999. Um, then we have the municipality elections. I call it like it's a legal and institutional patchwork. Because yes, things happened and politicians from Kosovo were uh, included in the system. But nothing changed from the situation. There was one, just one legal authority, 1244 and just these couple of institutions. So. Um, the constitutional debate did not begin at this time. It, uh, it started earlier than 1999, the constitutional debate, especially on the Kosovo-Albanian side. And uh, of course it intensified in the situation, realizing that there is a void. There was no Constitution, very rare, was an unconstitutional uh, situation in Kosovo. One of the few societies there was no constitution applied. So we had several attempts, 1999, but then especially in 2000, to draft interim constitutions or constitutions for Kosovo. Some took place uh, elsewhere, for example in Switzerland, but there were also uh, groups, experts, Kosovo experts, uh, preparing drafts for constitutions in Kosovo itself, presenting them to the international community, to UNMIC. This, this could be our new interim constitution. This could fill the void. This is the new source. This is also the key motive, as we understand, understand constitution as a symbol of sovereignty. The goal and the attempt to have a constitution is very much understandable from these competing interpreters who don't have their own legal source at that time. So in winter 2000-2001, even Anmik realized, under the pressure, we need a solution for this. And then the international administration announced um, a so-called legal framework. And this is uh, our case now, the joint working group on the legal framework. I call it here a discursive event in the struggle to create authority. Because imagine, you have the people from Kosovo realizing we need a new source for authority, um, working in the direction of getting a constitution, and on the other side we have UNMIC realizing we're working on base of 1244, we cannot 
we cannot give a constitution. We want just some kind of legal framework that we start the institution running the new, it was for the provisional institution of self-government, start something. And then we have this working group, all the hopes um, clashes, all the ideas on how this, this society should be governed in the next decades clash in this working group. It consisted of seven internationals and seven um, uh, uh, Kosovo representatives. Five from UNMIC, Council of Europe and external chair. I had the possibility to talk to some of them. Because we have three party representative, you are aware of these parties, uh, two independent or civil society members, and two so called minority representatives one Serb, one Serb, Kosovo Serb, and one Bosnian. It was constituted in March, and just a couple of weeks later, it effectively stopped working. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was, there was a high pressure put on, the, on this, uh, on this uh, working group to finish these legal framework, as it was called in the beginning, as soon as possible to give the, to give UNMIC the possibility to uh, decide for a date for your first elections here in Kosovo. Host was always UNMIC. I think the setting is interesting. Everybody came to the UNMIC building. It was in a huge conference room in the UNMIC. The final drafting was done by UNMIC, so there was a secretariat and they brought everything together. Um, and indeed, on the 15th of May, uh, two months later, there was the promulgation of the framework um, by, the, by the SRSG at that time, Hans Hecker. I want to immediately get into the, the, the um, interpretations and the authoritative communication. So, all the work I did uh, was uh, basically on, it was public documents by, by UNMIC press briefings, um, we did, uh, with the cooperation of the University of Pristina, uh, Dr. Sahadeh Tilimani, we looked into Albanian newspapers to get original quotes from that time for the uh, communication. And, as I mentioned before, some interviews with working people, uh, working group uh, people, and, of course, uh, the secondary literature. Almik, through the whole time of this, working on this legal framework, had a very strict interpretation of 1244. Um, I call it they, they established a, a mostly discursive constraint, constraints and a language of containment. So regarding the character of the framework, no interim constitution. Um, uh, the constitutional framework was a, was, a, was a compromise formula suggested by UNMIC in April, and even that compromise the uh, party members refused to accept. Um, there was a recognition that the document has had a constitutional character, uh, strangely enough, but um, uh, so no constitution was possible. The, wo the working group itself was considered to be a technical body, on an eye level, but a technical body. The text of the framework was strongly influenced. There was an international draft. The experts met long before it was presented to the Albanian or the other uh, Kosovo uh, experts. There was a draft uh, in, in February and this draft was the starting point of the working group. The form of the framework it, uh, uh, should only be a, a regulation. And regulation, you have to understand, that uh, are always just normal laws, law acts for UNMIC and 1244 is always above a regulation and the authority of the SRSG. And the content of the framework, the containment of self-government as much as possible and symbols of serenity. I will talk to you about it when we get to the, uh, when we get to the side of the Kosovo experts. Uh, I will uh, <coughs> give you some detailed content uh, discussions. And then there was a huge public. All these points were publicly discussed. It's not behind closed doors. A huge discussion going on in press briefings, uh, in the media on the Serbian influence. And UNMIC decided, because um, uh, the Serb participant in the working group, it was, I call it the politics of the empty chair, it just appeared at the beginning and then there was no Serb representative until the end and then all the struggle of another representative came and then the working group dissolved effectively at that time. So, um, it was very uh, interesting discussion going on between the rest of the working group, the Kosovar experts, 
and Anmik about the role of Serbia, which itself was not present. There was no representative, and of course the government was not present. Absolutely, understand. Um, and when you look into the, uh, the strategy um, Anmik used, uh, it had to justify the inclusion of Yugoslavia and the interest, again and again, due to the resolution 1244. And I call it in the working group, the experts took a position like a assigned council for the Serb community because they themselves did not participate. Of course, there are also intervening political processes um, which were not publicly discussed. I would just want to give you some uh, examples. For UNMIC, it turned out to be very, very complicated to present a close interpretation of 1244 themselves because the Security Council itself debated it still. There was no unitary interpretation of 1244. What did Anmik? It decided to take the most strictest position, not a middle ground, but a very strict position. I would say it weakened the interpreter on the ground. When you refer to a document and say this is the reason why you cannot do something and somebody is discussing still the document, I would say it weakens me as the interpreter presenting this is my interpretation. We had a huge internal resistance of UNMIC against the, the working group and the, um, the transfer of powers because uh, uh, the fear of reduction, economic reason, losing jobs, etc. Um, then the discursive constraints, like we cannot have an interim constitution. UNMIC had to enforce that even in the working group because there were international experts who discussed that, of course you can call it into a uh, constitution, don't worry, it's not a problem. And even inside the internationals, UNMIC had to uh, contain the language. Actually, the chair was told every time when he had a public appearance, you're not supposed to use certain words. He had a list of forbidden words he, he was not supposed to mention uh, in, uh, in television, for example. And political influence of other key players. I don't want to go in any uh, conspiracy theories, but there were other people present at the at the working group who, uh, which uh, they are not mentioned in any public documents, and they influenced the text of the document uh, decisively. Big country on the other side of the ocean. So then let's let's see the uh, interpretation and authoritative <laughs> communication of the Kosovo political which I want to call, if you compare it to the legal interpreter or the, or the formal uh, uh, interpreter, in that situation, before the, the national reaction started, I can call them the future or competing interpreters. Of course, the Kosovo, the PDK, LDK, etc., challenged the interpretation of Arnik, presented alternative interpretations in integrating the past of the society, the present, and the future. Character of the framework, they wanted a constitution. The working group, it was a political body for them, not a technical. And even beyond the content of the framework, there was a scandal where the two independent members of the working group had to resign in Kovatitore. There was a document published, an international draft. Kovatitore um, uh, received this draft from an unknown source. And there was a huge outcry, and the independent uh, members decided to resign. The political members of the working group decided to stay because they could relate their own work in the working group with their future position as interpreter after election. They could get in a position of, uh, of uh, power themselves. The text of the framework, there was minor influence by the Kosovo side. They were um, faced with the draft I've mentioned, but they could, they could integrate decisive changes. The form, obviously, they didn't want to have a bundle of regulations, they wanted to have one constitutional document. And when you look at the content, um, the symbols of sovereignty, of course, were very important. They want, so, the, the assembly should, should be called parliament, not assembly. Uh, there should be a president elected by the people. There should be a constitutional court for the interim constitution. There should be a referendum. This was very important for PDK, because Harden Thaci fought hard for a referendum at the Ramuye just a couple of years ago. Um, uh, these are some of the content discussions. And we have to be very honest with that. Most of them, most of the, the, uh, the hopes and wishes of the, uh, of the Kosovo are 
experts didn't make it in the, in the document. And the circuit influence, obviously, in the, the public discussion, as I said before, these were all very highly public discussed uh, processes. Of course, the Serbian influence was perceived as a threat just one and a half years, two years later after the war. And um, being in the position that in the end of April, when the working group stopped working productively and UNMIC took the document to political consultation, nobody really understood because it was like uh, uh, discussing with the quid, discussing with the Security Council, then going to the neighboring countries, going to the European Union, then going back to New York, discussing again with the quid, with the contact group, etc. From the position of the, from the, from the, from the position of uh, the Kosovo political actors, it went out of the body they could influence it, the working group itself. Of course, also there were intervening processes on the on the on the Kosovo side. PDK, LDK. Uh, there were conflictive relations, obviously. You all know the stories after the war. It was a very difficult situation for the political actors to co cooperate. Um, they realized the lack of legal status of yourself if you are taking part in a discussion that concerns your future but you don't have any authoritative position. You don't have a legal position in it. You're just part of a regulation you like GIA's, uh, I said the agreement before, these were all only regulations. So the realization of the lack of your own status uh, also influenced the, the, the process, definitely. There was strong resistance and critique in the population and of other political actors that these parties cooperated with UNMIC in this process, went into the working group. Every time at the International Administration Council there was a huge debate, and it is said in Coaditore, Bota Sot, Epoca Ere, the political uh, members of, of like Fauci uh, Hardin, Rugova, and also the, the members in the working group, for example, Fabio Sidiu, your later president, he was part of the working group, for example, um, was, they were attacked in the discussions uh, with other people, with other political bodies. Because why do you agree to this? Why do you agree to the procedure, uh, etc.? So it was a very complicated situation and the awareness of the upcoming elections. So presenting your interpretations to get on a later stage in the possibility to convince the, the, the people in this election process also influenced them, obviously. I want to jump to my conclusions. Um, when you look into the language, and I start with Amrik again, I start with the international stage. If you think of UNMIC as the interpreter, and of 1244 as the source of, the, uh, of, uh, of UNMIC, and as the, the symbol for your future, because in 1244, a document that was written in New York, the future of this society was written down, partly. So, UNMIC constantly referred back to 1244. I was surprised how often they did. It was not, it was, it happened basically in every press conference. It was not like a subtext, like everybody knows what's, uh, uh, this is my source. They refer to it constantly. Um, so they wanted to establish, of course, as the only rightful interpreter, and the interpretations of 1244 as correct. But exactly this position was challenged by the Kosovo actors because they also presented interpretations of 1244. Very interesting. Totally different interpretations. When Omic said, it's not allowed due to 1244, then they did a legal argument, no, look, it is allowed, and we have this case and this case, and it could be, it could be also another interpretation. So Omic was challenged from the beginning, I would say, due to the strict interpretations. If you look into the language, it's very defensive. Imagine you go up to this place, I come here every day, and I tell you, I'm sorry, this is not possible, this is not possible, you don't get food, I don't have books, you cannot come tomorrow, uh, I do not allow you this, I do not allow you that. And this is really the language, you can, you can really trace it back in content analysis. So it's a very defensive, and over the process of the technical of the working group, it turned out to be even more and more technical. So the argument was, we cannot decide this, we cannot decide this, let's talk about the only technical uh, uh, issues, a language of containment. And there is no, and I really, I really mean it, I think uh, there is no positive or integrating message that UNMIC could transport in this process. 
I said before, they referred constantly back to 1244. 1244, it was obvious for everybody in the room, it was an external document. And in constantly referring back to you uh, basically working on the basis of an external document, you distance yourself. You distance yourself in language. And in the end, there was no compromise in 1244. The Kosovo Albanian or the Kosovo political actors always including, for example, also the Bosniak uh, members, so there was a broad coalition, um, uh, insisted on the symbols of sovereignty, and uh, UNMIC refused, and so in the end it was coerced. UNMIC uh, drafted the last version of the text, giving in some points, like constitutional framework, I mentioned it before, and if you, if you come back to, to being an authority, and Hannah Arendt is, is doing nice work on this, um, if, you, if you use coercion, this is the absence of authority. In the end, it's the absence. It's not the absence of the legal authority of, of, of 1244 or of, of UNMIC. This is not in question. But the absence of the positive interpretative authority. You can present your, uh, the audience if you force something upon them. It's not authority. On the other side, the Kosovo political leaders, strangely united in this, pro in this process, in the interviews I've did, and also in the, in the public documents, you have a, a really a combined effort of the three major parties um, at that time to unite and present the same kind of counter interpretations in the public obviously in the election campaign later, and then in the end of 2001, conflict <laughs> broke up again between the parties. But at that time they are united. They successfully integrated in well-known symbols and motives. I found a very nice comment on Huffin Fauci, it was a huge comment in Coeditore, and he explains, I don't know whether he wrote it or somebody else, he explains really the, the history of Kosovo as a, as a nation-state, as a state. And artfully combining the new language of 1244, of Rambouillet, of the international state-building and peace-building processes with motives of national struggle, biblical suffering against the Serb oppression, etc. It's a very interesting text indeed. So, 1244, the framework, the future of the society of Kosovo, all were integrated. So, I would say, I would argue, they managed to position themselves versus this huge legal authority of 1244 as future interpreters. And what we see there, this early 2001, is nothing else like the attempt of transforming old authority from the Republic of Kosovo, Rugova, etc., into the new political setting. Um, as a, my, my last remarks, and then we can go into the discussion. I'm sorry, maybe I'm, I'm not sure about the time. Um, if we consider that, it, that if you coerce a document after a long public debate and you don't find a compromise as failure of being an authority in regard to the constitutional framework, I would argue that, the, that in spring 2001 this long progress began when you see a, a um, decrease of influence of 1244 as a point of reference. Um, uh, it turned even worse after 2004 than when the negotiations, the Sari negotiations started. And I had an inter interesting interview with an UNMIC uh, legal officer, high uh, level legal officer uh, from 2007 and he said basically in 2007 we couldn't do anything uh, anymore. 1244 was dead. You couldn't work with it. You couldn't argue on the basis of 1244. So, um, there were decisions of UNMIC not to implement things that were written down by themselves in the framework. For example, there was a special chamber on constitutional framework matters. It was never realized. It was never realized. Not, never implemented. And if you look at the three participating parties, in the election of 2001, they together won about 80% of the votes, and they are still, together with some other political parties, still 10 years later, the most influential political actors. It cannot prove that we have an established interpreter, but it is a, a hint 
that the authority process of these parties managed to succeed on some level. A theoretical observation would be the legal quality of a document, especially after a conflict situation, a situation where you have competing authorities, the legal quality maybe gives you no um, uh, information about the de facto authority uh, an institution has. And authority generation processes of international actors and national actors are very, very much different because they refer to different sources. So I would also argue that you don't find what is called in literature a transfer of authority. You can find a transfer of positions, of institutions, but authority generation is something every actor has to do for him or herself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben, for your fascinating uh, lecture. I think, well, we have another probably 20 minutes for questions, but I want to abuse my dominant position as a as chair to He's ask us, uh, He's <laughs> us. Abuse of dominant position um, to ask a, a question. I think it'd be worth to focus a little more on the extent to which the case study that you brought to bear uh, here today, um, the extent to which it sheds light on the theoretical debate on authority, right? So we have two competing theories of authority that I think you distinguish quite, quite masterly. On the one hand, we have the idea of authority as being a authority, and I think that's the legalistic, what I would call institutionalist idea of authority, right? And the competing one is the idea of authority as being in authority. In is the legal one, and N is Oh, in is the legal one. Okay, so in authority, so an institution that is in authority is an institution that has authority based on its legal and institutionalist backing. Okay. Being a authority is the institution or the source of authority that has authority de facto, right? Based on other processes, the ones that you uh, brought to light. Okay, but it seems to me that if your case study was supposed to be a corroboration of the non-legalistic idea of authority, it seems to me that that scores a fairly lukewarm, lukewarm victory for that body of theory. I mean, you, you talked quite extensively about how the legal, the legal authority in Kosovo, namely ANMIC, managed, if not to neutralize, but at least to contain quite, um, quite, um, uh, quite significantly competing sources of authority here in Kosovo, what you call the competing interpreters. Of course, they did manage to streamline their demands into the final constitutional framework document, but their ability to do so, and I think you brought all those mechanics, all those dy dynamics to light quite, uh, quite masterly, was very brutally contained, right? They clearly were neutralized, but they were brought into the fold of the legal authority. So it seems to me that the legal authority and the de facto authority to a large extent coincide. So I would say that this is a corroboration of the legalistic uh, approach to authority. I would, um, if, I, if I can ask, answer this immediately, I would say what, what UNMIC really achieved, or external actors really achieved, is like hindering the actors in Kosovo to develop own legal or formal positions of authority in the first years. But the being an authority I would argue that they never reached this, this realm of the political actors. Because if, if you look, for example, as the, of the, pers uh, the person of President uh, Rubova, um, he and LDK, despite all the problems after the war, despite all the discussions, if you look also in the electoral outcome, it was a huge number, they, they could tell a story that went back to the beginning of the 90s. Who could take this away from the interpreter? Who can take this away from a political actor here? Uh, the experiences under, uh, in, in the difficult situation in the 90s, the referendum, the two, uh, I think there were two elections for Rugova for, for and the LDK. Who could take this narrative away? It was impossible to take away. The only thing Ulmik achieved, and it was part of the mandate, yes, to dissolve any 
uh, other bodies. This, I would agree, absolutely. But I would say the other dimension of authority was never reachable for, for Nick. And the same with other cases of, of political actors who try to establish it. For example, uh, uh, thought, uh, Hassan Fauci, he, he, he really referred a lot to Yashari uh, in, in the active campaigns and also in this de uh, debate. Maybe he's still doing this, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, PDK, um, obviously, due to the regional, etc. So, who can take this away? I think I, I would disagree. So we have these two dimensions, they are always working, they are always present. It's not the one or the other. There is no, I would say, there is no, even UNMIC in the beginning when the euphoria about the end of the war and the, the public yeah, euphoria that, that a new beginning was there. I think there, w there, there was some positive relation with UNMIC uh, regarding the language and the symbols it used. Uh, but um, uh, I think it diminished really fast. So any questions from, from the floor? So, uh, I'm Mari. First of all, I want to thank you about a great presentation. Uh, if I didn't misunderstand you, you were talking about a very special document here. And uh, I want to know what was special about the case of Kosovo that made it uh, uh, to have a document so special. Uh, different from the ex Yugoslavian countries or any other country in the world. Thank you. Well, I know that you've looked closely at the constitutional framework, but uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the 2008 process in terms of the drafting of the constitution and if you can compare the two and what, were the, what was the difference because uh, in reality I think that the differences are of course a step further but absolutely not to the point that we would like to see a constitutional process. We got the draft of the constitution as a public one week before it was uh, approved. Uh, the parliament that voted the constitution never was participating in election as a constitutional parliament that is supposed to approve it. Uh, you know, legitimacy of it. And for both of them, uh, what do you think in your mind uh, led the politicians at that time the constitutional framework to respect that if it was coerced and the one that they did not agree to why did they play along the rules of the constitutional framework where it was not a document they agreed to and the second question is can you are you, you're from germany right yeah okay can you compare this to the post second world war constitution of germany when it was handed to germany in a way uh, and what was the difference that makes the constitution of germany so successful today in our constitution, not so much, or maybe we have to wait some, some 60 years. 60 years. Yeah. If you look at just from the, from the perspective of international law, uh, the situation, why the constitutional framework was so special, it's just like this, this uh, it was the first case that uh, an international territorial administration decided, and uh, not even the UN, first case ever, to, um, to write together with the, with the, with the people of this, uh, of this respective territory to write a constitutional-like document. There was no case before. It clearly, it clearly um, evolves out of a very strange compromise that was found in 1244 at that time. I know you are maybe a little bit tired of hearing this, uh, but um, it is a special situation, it used to be a special situation, and so uh, Honestly, it's, it's not very surprising that, that these kind of creative things uh, happened. The International the, the Security Council forbid a constitution at the time. So the resolution, uh, this, this, uh, this country wasn't allowed to have one from the legal perspective because uh, another uh, uh, constitution still applied. It was just like uh, the Yugoslavian constitution was like fighting with the English word and not too good into law English. Um, uh, but uh, 1244 took precedence of the, the, the other constitution. So um, the special case of this document evolves of a long presence of internationals administrating and a population, full-fledged political actors, a long history of constitution, a long history of statehood, 
um, and the realization that you have a you have a void, you have a society, you don't have laws. If you look what what kind of laws were applied, of course you had laws, but what kind of laws uh, used to be applied in, uh, from from UNMIC or for the administration? Well, sometimes it was a list like this: uh, regulations, then laws in a certain field from the from from before 1989, etc. Et so it was very complicated. So this made this uh, process very very unique, and the document. Uh, the compare the situation, okay, between 2001 and 2008. I think in 2008 all the symbolic questions were resolved. Uh, the, the symbolic questions were the most complicated back then. There was a, there is a list of responsibilities handed over from Unmig to the new institution. It wasn't, the discussion was hard but not too hard. The symbolic questions, parliament, etc., president, um, <coughs> They were very constitutional, they were very complicated. And I think this is the major distinction. You, you, there is independence since 2008. You have a constitution, one of the most... Uh, your constitution receives high praise out there. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's considered to be a very, very modern European constitution. But if you look at it politically, I have to admit um, that the influence of external actors changed its appearance, but obviously is a huge influence still, Atisari, etc. But um, in comparison to the constitutional framework, who never foresaw independence, it was really, it could, went on for, for uh, there was another discussion I didn't mention, the, the Kosovo uh, uh, actors wanted to limit the framework. And of course, we'll mix that. No, it's not possible. It will go on like, like forever. So, a very spooky document. Uh, so, now you're in the much. Uh, this, this is a constitution that will one day, even if it was drafted by, by to a huge degree by international actors, um, will uh, constitute a situation where international actors won't be as present as now. I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 5 years, I'm not sure. Then, the politicians, why did they agree? This is a very important question because this is one of my points I, I want to make clear. They agree because they can be an interpreter in the future. They, they compromise in the content because they know they can be in a position of influence and political decision making and interpretation, not like the both dimensions of authority, to a later stage. I had people in interviews telling me, like, I know the independent members, they could resign. We couldn't resign. It's not possible. We wanted to, to have the next step. We wanted to go on. We wanted to, to get in a position where we can decide something for our own. I think it's, it, it makes our perspective stronger. Because, um, uh, as sad as it may sound, it's not about the content. It's about the symbolic uh, level of this document. And it's about the future position of the political actors. And to compare the, the situation post-Second World War, I'm not an expert on the German constitution, but obviously there are some things we can compare. You have, uh, uh, I would say in, in, in Germany, the occupation of Germany uh, due to what happened in the Second World War had uh, a, a, a really another dimension and uh, I'm not sure whether you realize but it ended in the beginning of the 90s uh, de, uh, de facto uh, so it, uh, hundreds of thousands of soldiers were still uh, in, in Germany the Russian soldiers etc. in the beginning of the 90s so um, the German do, constitution was elaborated only by politicians. The Franklin document yeah. in uh, 47 was the forecast of the, uh, for the later constitution. Honestly, I wanted to uh, refer to Wolf Lapins. This is Wolf Lapins, by the way. He's head of pretty good tradition. The so called Frankfurt documents in 47 they were elaborated by only German politicians. And they were um, were organized, of course, by the Allied forces, 
three, Americans, French, and, and uh, Britain. But they had the order to organize and to elaborate a constitution. Yeah? And this constitution, so-called the Herrenchiemsee Conference, was then the outcome. The outcome was then the constitution in uh, 1940, 1949. In the two years, year, two years earlier, there was the so-called Franklin document. Although it take it took time, two years, two years they elaborated this constitution. But by the German politicians only. Only, only, only. Would it have been possible that a document was adopted as constitution against the occupied forces? I think we all can agree it would have been possible. But it was written by German. And there was no working group consisting like 50 50 or something. Uh, so there are some similarities, but uh, also uh, huge differences. Okay. Yeah. Sandra Norman, thank you so much for your comments. Mm -hmm. I found the lecture very interesting. Um, I was interested in your conclusions. You made a very, um, uh, on your last slide, you had a separation between the international and national actors, and that's certainly the way it has been discussed in the QA. I was uh, wondering if you could comment on the case, uh, the Iraqi case, where a constitution was built and you had actually, you know, strong U.S. involvement in the writing of that constitution. You might even say if you wanted to take a, uh, an extreme position that it was imputed. Uh, but you have two of the three major factions in Iraq who, who uh, sort of opposed it. One who accepted it because they got their best uh, they got they got a good deal on it. The Kurds, the Kurds versus the Sunnis and the Shias. So this is just an example. You don't have to deal specifically with this, but I'm wondering if the key distinction is not international versus national, but whose interests are best represented in this. A very important point in the case of Kosovo, due to the strange situation of, of 1244 and the, the high movement of the of the United Nations and this working group on island of 50% was clear from the beginning that the internationals were sitting on the table. There was no image of like, uh, or no illusion like, oh, you write the document and then we call for me later. No, no, we are here, we are here, we are controlling everything. This is the draft and now I work on the draft. So I think it's, it's different, it's very different because in cases like the, uh, like Iraq and also Afghanistan, I think it's it's much more uh, the, the external actors wanted to keep the perception that it was it is a national a national project itself. But besides that, I agree with the interest thing. I, I don't think it, it it's maybe what, what I've answered in regard to the, 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 the decisions of the politicians to stay inside the progress. Uh, 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 knowing that most of the demands uh, weren't realized here in Kosovo. Most of the demands didn't pass, but they stayed in the process. So it's also about interest, as I said, I think the interest of a future position of um, authority. But other like this, honestly, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid to speak, uh, speak about, about Iraq anyway, because I don't have any, any clue. Uh, comment. I think that coercion and imposition uh, are only two of the many mechanisms in which rules and norms can be transferred from, say, the external normative uh, sphere into the domestic normative sphere. We, we, we've been talking quite exclusively about coercion as the dynamic through which norms are transferred, but I think that hegemony is also a very important mechanism in which uh, norms can be transferred, and the idea when it comes to hegemony is that norms are internalized uh, by the recipient country, let's say. And there's no need for the application of force and coercion from the outside for those norms to reproduce themselves. And we've seen that quite extensively in, a, in uh, here in Kosovo when it comes to economic and commercial law, which is what I've documented in my, in my own work. It's really astonishing to see the degree of resemblance between the current domestic laws and the previous superseded unmake regulations. If you look at the law on mines and minerals, the normative framework for mining and resource extraction in Kosovo, if you look at the normative framework for the restructuring and privatization of socially owned enterprises, those laws that have been passed by parliament in 
2010, one in 2010, one in 2011, replacing the previous <coughs> ANMIC laws. They are just a copy, lock, stock, and barrel of the superseded ANMIC regulations. And clearly, that wasn't imposed. In fact, those, those norms, those body of norms, came from the domestic institutions, and yet they're just the same. So, I don't know if you'd like to comment on that, but. If, if we look into the process of lawmaking, um, and you know, I, the, I think the constitutional framework works well for, for our uh, theoretical approach because it's like, it's an intersection of everything a political order or society uh, may refer to. Um, in, at that time, there were clearly alternative uh, drafts on the table from the Albanian side or from, from, from other actors. But Anbik decided, to work on the basis of a of an own draft and uh, and uh, implement this draft in the end. So what you are uh, mentioning is is a very important point if you look into the longer process of how norms through hegemony or like incorporation or just like time time questions. Sometimes lawmaking and I have a feeling that it was also the case. Here, if you look at the end of the supervised uh, independence and other cases, it's just like we just have two months left. What 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 kind of document uh, do we take? Okay, we have this document. So just let's merge it and let's put a title, and then we have a law. Let's deal with it later. So I think it's a very important point. I wouldn't. Um, uh, I don't think it, is, it fits uh, regarding this document because it was a very tense time. You had clear alternatives on the table. I couldn't go into that, uh, and um, so it is a very interesting, complex process of all these different interpretations, uh, and it turned out the way it, it, it did. Thank you very much. So.